Okay, Steve, the Word of God is alive and powerful. And it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and tents of the heart. All Scripture is God breathed. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly, rightly dividing, dividing the Word of Truth. And, uh, Steve, we're going to open the Word of Truth here in just a minute, but before we do, it's time to prepare to study uh, through the uh, three-rebound technique. And so we'll give, uh, give us about 15 seconds of time, and, uh, and you know, I, you don't, I'll tell you what, you don't really have to watch the clock. You know, let me tell you how I do that. When I, when I say, okay, we have 15 seconds, I'm going to hit it. One two, three. <laughs> and so I just sort of count it out, yeah. you know, and give our folks an opportunity to, mm-hmm. uh, to do this. Uh-huh. That's right. So if, uh, if necessary, confess sin, Steve, and then go ahead and pray for us. Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer and, yes. and uh, the fact that it has... Uh, a part in it to be ask for forgiveness, Father, to cleanse us from all unrighteous. And Father, we know that your Son died on the cross for those sins and mm-hmm. give us eternal life and salvation. You've also given us your Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word with God, the word, word was God. Yes. And we are here to rightly divide that Word with this ministry. Dr. Jim, we thank you, Father, for him and his passion is our teacher's Word. And tonight we have a good lesson that every American, everyone needs to yes. understand and know. Yes. So we ask for those ears who are listening to understand it and to absorb it. And maybe many others will listen to it later on in the, in the recordings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. And uh, our study tonight is A Client Nation Under God. And really the full title would be The United States is a Client mm-hmm. Nation Under God. And we want to approach this subject, Steve. And I'm certainly glad for those folks who are online with us, and I pray that there will be more who will actually get this on Facebook. And even as a recording after tonight, it will also be up on YouTube. And by the way, folks, I am in the process of actually um, revitalizing our website, uh, tcwolc.org. And I'm in the process of doing that. We'll put some notes and things like that on that website. So let's move on from here. Steve, a client nation under God. Let me just sort of chat with you uh, about this here for just a minute. Uh, none, of the, none of what I'm about to say tonight in this message will make any sense except you do the very thing that I've said time and time and time and time again, and that is until you understand, Christian, until you understand, unbeliever, until you understand the angelic conflict, none of this makes any sense. Because in this day and age, we have, a, we have a multitude of people in the United States who don't really think very highly of our nation. What they see is what's happening out here by way of immigration. They see what's happening uh, by way of uh, finances. They see what's happening by way of health care, education, et cetera. And they're listening to the wrong news media, listening to the wrong people. And all they're doing is being deceived. They're being brainwashed along the line, and uh, as a result of that, you you end up making a statement about something, and immediately somebody wants to ram something down your throat. So I want to say this again. None of what follows tonight will make any sense to any of us until we understand the larger picture of human, uh, human history and also the angelic conflict and how that conflict is to be resolved according to God's word. Now, let me ask you this question, Steve. It's not a very, it's not a very difficult, but I know that you know the answer. Uh, who, who is involved in the angelic conflict? Every human being. So it's more than just Christians. Is that right? right? Every not, human being, black, white, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, female, male, boy, girl, it doesn't make a bit of difference. If you're a human being, you are drafted into the angelic conflict the moment you are uh, the moment you were born physically. Now, what that means then is you have to understand whether you're an unbeliever or a believer, God has a plan for your life, and it doesn't end with just getting saved. That's right. Now, what we need to understand tonight is, first, that a client nation, a client nation is, what is it? A client nation is a national entity, Greece, France, uh, Japan, Russia, 
uh, South Africa, Egypt, uh, that, those are nations. But a, a client nation is a national entity that is sponsored by God the Father. In other words, you don't choose to be one. God, in his overall plan, in his omniscience, sees where the, where the people are that would make up a client nation, and he's the one that designates that. Now, there's no place in the scripture that says, hey, you know, uh, uh, France is a client nation. Hey, Cuba is a client nation. Hey, the United States is a client nation. No, but when you understand the context of the Bible and, and are able to analyze human history, you realize what we're about to say is true. So first of all, a client nation is a national entity sponsored by God the Father who assigns the responsibility for the formation, listen, for the formation, the preservation, communication, and fulfillment of the canon of Scripture. Now what happened is this. In that phrase, formation, preservation, communication, and fulfillment, Israel throughout the whole Old Testament was given the responsibility of forming the Scripture. So what happens all the way up through uh, from, from Genesis to Malachi, that's the Old Testament. Then we had some of the disciples who actually wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then we had, P, uh, we had Luke come forward and write the book of Acts. Then we got 13 epistles that were written by Paul. Then we had uh, some epistles that were written by Peter and uh, Titus mm -hmm. and, uh, and John. Okay, so that makes up the idea here that the, God gives the responsibility for the formation, the preservation, the communication, and fulfillment of the canon of Scripture. Now stop and look at those words, the formation. In other words, God revealed his word in certain periods of time. He revealed them to someone, and they wrote that down. So that in that sense, we saw, again, all the writers of the Old Testament— we saw uh, Mark and John and, and Luke and Matthew write the Gospels. Then Paul comes along, and God is assigning to these people the responsibility of actually preserving, that is, writing this down. So they're the responsibility for the formation of the Scripture, then the preservation of it. Now, we're going to talk about the preservation of it, and that's how do you preserve the Word of God? Well, let's we'll talk about it. Then the communication. So whoever these client nations are, they form the Word of God, they preserve the Word of God, they communicate the Word of God, and then guess what? You live it out. You fulfill the canon of Scripture. So a client nation has those responsibilities, formation, preservation, communication, and fulfillment of the canon of Scripture. Now what we'll do is we're going to take a look and see some of these client nations. Who are they? Who were they? Well, until 70 A.D., that's a long time ago. Until 70 A.D., Israel was a client nation under God. God told us that. He didn't use the phrase client nation, but he said, you're a priest, a priest nation to us. So, he, so these, this uh, Israel then was given the responsibility of forming the scripture, preserving it, communicating it, and fulfilling it. Now, what we're going to find out is Israel didn't, sort of messed up all, uh, somewhere along the line. They, they actually, uh, the Jewish writers wrote the scripture, but boy, preserving it, they didn't do a good job. Communicating it, no. Fulfilling it, no, they didn't. So until 70 AD, Israel was a client nation unto God. Now, what that means then, Steve, if they had a point in time where God assigned them this responsibility, and that would begin with Abraham, because that's when Israel began, then when God gave them the Mosaic Law under Moses, see, these people then are receiving the Word of God, and they're preserving it, and God assigned them this responsibility for forming the, the, the Word of God, preserving it, communicating and fulfilling it. That's what made them a client nation. So what we need to realize is while the word client isn't in the, in the scripture anywhere, that is a term that describes a responsibility of forming, preserving, communicating, and fulfilling the scripture. And I tell people, said, well, you know, I don't like that term. Then look, call it what you want, but just make sure that whatever word you assign to these, these things, that you don't change the responsibility of formation, preservation, communication, and fulfillment. So question, so far. Who, who was the first group that had the uh, responsibility of forming, preserving, communicating, and fulfilling the scripture? The nation of Israel. There you go. The nation of Israel. Until how long, Steve? Until 70 A.D. 70 A.D. Now, since A.D. 70, 
other nations, one at a time, have served a client nation, served as a client nation of God. So what happened is when Israel went out of the fifth cycle of discipline, and the reason I'm teaching this is because we are in the book of Acts, and we are in chapter 20, and actually there was a transitional period of the age of Israel before we ever get to 70 AD, when in fact at that point in time, the Christian, the Christian way of life, the body of Christ, the age of grace was full blown, okay? Mm -hmm. But prior to that time, Paul's out there preaching the gospel, moving up to 70 AD, because God had not yet finished with Israel until 70 AD. But since that time, God had to have somebody mm -hmm. that would be responsible for the formation, the preservation, the communication, and the fulfillment of the canon of Scripture. We can say, we can say that, you know, that Israel failed, and he had to he turn to the other nations. That's exactly what happened. They failed to form, preserve, communicate, fulfill the Scripture as custodians of it. That's exactly and they right. Failed, and he turned to... So what happened now, notice, notice what is said here... Um, in this in this point right here, since 70 A.D., other nations, but was it's one yeah, at a time. time. So what happened? There have been several nations throughout the history, and rather than take time to do that and name them all, that's no big deal. But what I want us to understand is, other nations, when Israel failed, God said, "Okay, look down there," and He said, "Oh, there you go. There's, right there's, there, there it is, right there." So they had a group of people in a nation that was sufficient enough for Him to call that a a a client nation that would be would be doing these very things. But just like Israel, because they're human beings, they, they started out well and they failed. Mm -hmm. Then they start out well and they will fail. Then he goes on to the next one. It would start out well and it would fail. Then he start out well and it would fail. Mm -hmm. So one right after another. Now what we see then is this. With this little di first diagram, when when the client nation actually began, it was, in fact, Israel, and this little square over here had, has the map of Israel. That's the yellow, yellow part of the map. That was Israel, and they were the client nation. But in 70 AD, up until, up until 1776, so between 70 AD and, and uh, 1776, there were many client nations, but remember, there was only one at a time. And because we are in the angelic conflict, go back and read Leviticus 26, which contains the five cycles of discipline to Israel that were attention getters. Mm -hmm. Each one was, was seven times greater than the, the one before. Remember when we talked about that? So what happened is you got these things, these things are what God's gonna do to you to get your attention to begin with. You don't get the picture. So it goes on to number two. And whatever whatever form of discipline is there, it's seven times greater than the one before. So by the time you get to the fifth, man, it's knockout time. You are out of here. You're gone, and they are out of land, okay? Now, what happened is all these client nations that came along, God had similar attention getters for them, and they failed. So they're either driven out of the land or destroyed, whatever's going on, and then he would move on to another area where there were, where there were people who would form, would form this client nation. So there were several client nations in this yellow circle here, there were several client nations until 1776, one right after the other. And one might be a little longer than uh, in, in a client nationship than opposed to another one, but there were several along the line. Then in 1776, I want us to look at the world map here. And since 1776, the United States of America has been a client nation under God. And since that point in time, since 1776, we are the client nation unto God. Now, I've got this map here. It's a world map. And I've got a, a, an arrow that's over to the United States indicating that we are a client nation unto God. Now, we're going to talk about that some more. You know, that's just a figment of your imagination. You just reached out there and grabbed something. No, I didn't. And here's the rest of the world out here. So of all these nations of the world, the United States in 1776 became a client nation under God. Why? Because the, the founding fathers, the people that were here in this nation at that point in time, met the criteria mm -hmm. for being a client nation. So the question then is this. What does it mean that the, that the United States of America is a client nation? So now without, without emphasizing it, just read that statement right here, Steve. 
This means that in 1776, God the Father had already provided every born-again Christian in the USA with everything needed to fulfill the following client nation responsibilities. Okay, so we're going to look at those responsibilities, but what we need to understand is that in 1776, God was going to need another client nation. nation. So in his omniscience, he's looking around the world and he says, whoa, look at this. Look at these people down here in this geographic location called America. He said, this means that in 1776, God had already provided. So he's looking down here at these people, and they're going to become a client nation under God. And God in his omniscience in the past had already prepared for everything they would need in his plan, and they were that kind of people because they had utilized what he had to be sufficient to do these following things. So read that statement one more time. This means that in 1776, God the Father had already provided every born-again Christian in the USA with everything needed to fulfill the following client nation responsibilities. And here are the following client nation responsibilities. One, two, three, four, five. Read them and read them slowly. Evangelize the unbelievers in the USA. Stop right there. Do you understand that, mm -hmm. folks? Evangelization. That's right. That a client nation is responsible. Awesome. Now, guess what you're doing? When you're doing that, you're and these things, you're preserving the Word of God, and you are communicating the Word of God. Okay. So, if you're going to preserve the Word of God, guess what? You just talked a little bit, little while ago. You, you understand it. Then you pass it on to your children. Then they pass it on to their children. Then they pass it on to your great-grandchildren. See, this is the preservation of the Word of God. So, first of all, if a client nation is going to be a client nation, they have the responsibility on what? Evangelize the unbelievers that are in the USA. That's exactly right. And secondly, what are they going to do? Communicate Bible doctrine to believers that are in the USA. So, you're going to evangelize them and get them saved. And then you... Then you're, going to take, then you're going to teach them Bible doctrine. That's exactly right. God wrote. So the third thing, protect Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth. Now, uh, now listen here. So you see that, that point there? Protect, protect Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth. I want to ask you a question. Do you think the majority of churches in the United States today are communicating absolute truth? No, see, not, that's a problem. Unfortunately, no. See, so we're, not, so we're not communicating, and because we're not communicating, we're not protecting mm. doctrine mm. by communicating absolute like truth. Say, rightly divide the word. That's yes. exactly right, Steve. And the fourth, uh, a fourth option here for the client but nation. To provide the USA as a place of safety for the Jews. That's absolutely right. And the fifth one? Send out missionaries to evangelize unbelievers in other nations. I just hit the button there and, and made that slide, so let's put it back where it belongs. Now, so there are the there are the five criteria mm -hmm. for be for being a a client nation under God. And right now, the United States in 1776 has fulfilled that responsibility. But now, what you're going to see is as time passes from 1776. And as you get closer and closer and closer to 2019, you're going to ask yourself a question. Are we still, are doing, we still doing these things? things? Uh -huh. And if you're not still doing these things, you might take a look at Leviticus 26 and find out what God did to Israel and what God has done to every other client nation under God that failed, failed in their them. responsibilities. Okay? Now, read this next statement, Steve. The first client nation under God was Israel. And Leviticus 26 teaches us how God dealt with every client nation. So not only does it tell us how he was going. See, he said, look, if you keep my word, hey, I'm going to bless you. But if you don't keep my word, here is what's going to happen. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five cycles of discipline. One right after another. And here again, the amount of time that it takes from to go from one to two to three to four to five. Now, it's not over a period of a week's time. Oh, yeah. and between one and two, it might be 30 years. Mm -hmm. Then it might be 10 years between two and three, you see. And but if we study this about Israel, we need to keep America in the back of our mind and see how this That's works. exactly right, Steve. That's exactly right. So the, the uh, Leviticus 26, the five cycles of discipline. Now, there's some bullet points here to help us to understand that, okay? Go ahead. 
Well, a client nation is blessed if the born-again believers in that nation are obedient to God. Now, stop right there. Man, that's big. See, that's that's exactly right. So if you know that the United States of America is a client nation under God, and you realize that these five responsibilities are ours, you take a look at those five responsibilities and ask yourself, how are we matching up to that here in this country? And basically, these are Christian responsibilities, okay? Mm -hmm. Christian responsibilities. So we see that a client nation is blessed if, and that word if there, it's it's a third-class condition. Maybe we will and maybe we won't. A client nation is blessed if the born-again believers in that nation are obedient to God. Now, that see, how can you be obedient to God if you don't know what obedience, obedience is requiring? Mm. How do you carry out obedience? Or if you're a nation full of unbelievers or the born-again believers nucleus is shrinking. Well, hold it. Don't go there. Don't go there. Yet. Don't go there. <laughs> not, not yet. Okay. So uh, here's okay. the issue then. A client nation is blessed if the born-again mm-hmm. Christians and believers in that nation and are that's exactly there. what happened, Dr. Jim, in the earlier times of America's history. That's what they were doing. That's exactly that's right. why we've been blessed for 200 that's years. That's exactly. In other words, they were doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, mm-hmm. second bullet point here. A client nation also undergoes cycles of discipline similar to Israel. If the born-again believer is in the client nation, if they are disobedient. See now, here's the issue. Well, you and Senator. I have talked. You and I have talked here um, uh, in terms of attention getters. And I think as we were talking talk about uh, about discipline, I think it might have been you that actually started using that yeah. term. It's an attention getter. Yeah. Attention getter. Yeah. Well, I picked that up because I think that's absolutely that's absolutely. And we used to share every week what happened in one week is unbelievable. Week to week, some things be so big, but a week or two later we forgot about them because more things had come. That's so, exactly anyhow, right. And healthy. these are the and these are attention getters. Now, here's something else, Steve. It doesn't have to happen to the. 50, entire 50 the states line. at one time. Right. You take a look and see what's happening in California. You say, whoops, something Fine. wrong out there. Mm-hmm. And I've continued to say that for months and months and months and months and months, here we are in Maumelle, Arkansas, and you see what happened. You saw what happened in California. You saw what happened in Washington and Oregon. You saw what happened in Florida. You saw what happened in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And you see what happened in New Mexico. You see what happened someplace else. You see what happened in North Dakota. You see what's going on in New York. You see what's happening in New York and New Hampshire. You see what's happening someplace else. And you say, wow, Lord, boy, are we, are we, are we fortunate here? We know not lucky, but are we fortunate. fortunate here? And I'm thinking, well, you know, still in all of that, man, we've got similar problems in our in uh, in Arkansas in terms of what Christianity is doing. So I'm sitting back and saying, well, our time's coming. Well, you Indeed. see what's happened. It is absolutely it has happened, and you know for a fact that here in your in your own family, Steve, in Toad Suck, Arkansas. Your mother has lost her house. That's Your right. sister has lost her house. And the truth of the matter is, is that some of them say, well, Steve, what did you do wrong? Mm-hmm. No, you see what happened is these people who are born again Christians who are obedient to the word of God are going to suffer by association mm-hmm. exactly. with those folks with whom you are attached. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that doesn't even necessarily mean that your mom or your sister was bad. It's they're, they're actually they mm-hmm. are suffering mm-hmm. by association with all that's going on across this country. Mm-hmm. Now the next bullet point: When a client nation is experiencing the last cycle of discipline, that client nation is destroyed, and its citizens are either scattered to the other nations or they die in the disaster. See, now you better we better understand that mm-hmm. because that's where we're headed. Well, I'm telling you, and here's where we're headed. If we if we miss the boat in 2020, mm. now it could happen later in 2024, yeah. 2028. But the truth of the matter is, we are on the right That's track right. right now, and we are we are um, uh, in Ezra 9:8. We are we in this country are are taking advantage of that, and so we we've, we've got an extended period of time. So the question is. In 2020, is that going to be extended to, in order for us to continue to become a to become a great nation again? Because we're not right now. We're we're in the process of that recovery. It's sort of like falling and breaking your hip. You know, you're in you're down. You're down. But now what happens is over a period of time, you get to heal. You get a little better. You get a little better. Next thing you're walking. Next time you're running. Uh, and so you're back to normal. You're back to normal again. So when a client nation has experienced the last cycle of discipline, that's the fifth yeah, cycle. cycle of discipline. Israel, 
got he, they were blown out of the land. They listen. The, the Roman Empire they destroyed the temple. They drove the they drove the people out of the land, and that's why Jews are scattered all over, over the, the world, world today. Mm -hmm. And it actually began before that, because in 70 A.D. that was the third time mm -hmm. that Israel had been driven out of the land. So we need to realize. Read that point again. When a client nation is experiencing the last cycle of discipline, which is the fifth cycle, mm -hmm. that client nation is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And its citizens are either scattered to other nations or they die in the disaster. See, and that's what, the, that's what causes the destruction of a nation. Mm -hmm. It will either, the people will be gone, or God just, uh, it, like an atomic bomb, just drop on here mm -hmm. and bingo. And that's what's always concerned us when we talk about the important other studies and, and prophecy. We, we can't tell where a nation is. Okay. Now, America is in that. And you have, you made the conclusion either it's a, a, a third world type thing that's that's worthy of mentioning mm -hmm. or it's gone. That's you know? exactly so, right. One of the two. Mm -hmm. But that's what, see, that's the word of God. Now, someone says, oh, I don't like this. I don't think that's right. The, the, listen, the thing that draws us into this conclusion is understanding what human history is mm -hmm. all about. And it's about resolving yes. the spiritual battle called the angelic and angel. learning what how he dealt with Israel in it. We can see that today in our history. It's the example. Mm -hmm. And how about these other nations? Mm -hmm. See, Israel wasn't the only oh, nation. Yeah. So what you have to understand is something about history to realize how God dealt with these nations. Now, from 70 A.D., Steve. Well, from 70 A.D. until 1776 A.D., there have been many different Gentile client nations. Mm -hmm. Never more than one at a time. Mm -hmm. And each of these Gentile nations, one after another, replaced Israel as a client nation. So what happened, each one replaced Israel, because remember, it was Israel's responsibility to do these five things. When they failed, God needed somebody to do it. Well, the world is, the world is divided into two groups, Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So if the Jews are set aside, all you got left is Gentiles. So what happens now is each of these Gentile nations where there was a nucleus of, of born-again believers, God assigned that responsibility. He didn't say, okay, down there, are you listening? You, uh, Uruguay. No, no, you over here uh, someplace else. No, he didn't do that. But the thing of it is, is that they had the conditions in that nation that would qualify them to the be a, a client nation. That's exactly right. They had to meet the criteria, and they did. So that they were, they were responsible. But when they failed in that responsibility, God said, just like Israel, you're done. Oh, by the way, over here, this one, this one's got the responsibility now. So in 17... Uh, Doctor, that doesn't mean there's one main client nation, but there could be other nations no. and some believers, too. Well, yes, but not, yeah. no, not client nation. Just a client nation. Yeah. They See, a client nation has that responsibility. The believers, believers all over the world, but their whole nation it was, didn't qualify to be the client that, nation. But they still, as Christians, they yeah. had that responsibility. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't a national right. responsibility. Right. Exactly. Got it. And there was only one mm -hmm. at a time. Mm -hmm. Now, for the past 243 years, mm -hmm. that's from 1776 mm -hmm. to 2019. Mm -hmm. Read that. For the past 243 years, from 1776... AD until today, the USA has been and still remains a client nation under God. Now I want us to understand that statement. We for 243 years we have mm. been a client nation under God. It has been and it remains today. So the very fact that we aren't what we really need to be doesn't mean, mean that we are not a client right. nation. We are on a downgrade. We have been on a downgrade until 2016. Then God gave us that little space of time to get this thing right. That's what you and I are all about, Steve. That's what, uh, that's what other pastors that we know are all about. They're out there teaching the Word of God. Daryl Anderson, for example. And by the way, Daryl is on his way to, uh, he and Nita are on their way to uh, Fargo, North Dakota tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow morning, they will spend it overnight there. Then they're going to fly to Denver for two, for two days, and then they are on their way back to the Philippines, okay? So now, let's, let's, uh, let's see this again. The, the idea here is that we, we have been for 243 years, and we need to understand that we still are a client nation. We haven't been destroyed. The people haven't been scattered just yet. Right. So we have the, we, the threat, the danger is that's, imminent. That's, imminent. that's exactly right, Steve. Now, at this moment, right, at this very moment, God is dealing with the USA in the same way he has dealt with Israel 
and every other Gentile client nation yeah. failed to carry out its responsibilities as a client nation. So here again, and what uh, we've been saying. That, that's exactly well, right. Now right, right now, now, right now, right now. Read that. Read this next one, Steve. Okay. Right now, the USA is suffering under divine discipline because born again Christians across this nation over the past 150 years have progressively and increasingly, just a little bit at a time, yes. failed God by carrying, by failing to carry out the responsibilities of a client nation. Those five responsibilities we mentioned earlier. Okay, now stop and look at this again. Right now, at this point in time, right now today, all you have to do is to look out mm -hmm. in the United States. You see all the wrangling. Uh -huh. You see all the fighting. You see the, the tension between the blacks and the whites. You see the tension between the blacks and the whites and the, and the Latinos. You see what's going on on the college campuses. You see what's happening in the public school system. You see what's happening in New York, California, et cetera. You see all that. And you say, oh, I guess oh, they, just, they, just some, happened. they just got some problems out there. Listen, this is the Angela conflict, and every human being, black, white, rich, poor, and you, you know that, every human being is, a, is responsible to become obedient to the plan of God for his life and the, his or her life, and that responsibility is to become exactly like Jesus Christ in his humanity. That means that when one person looks at another, when another person looks at another, when we look at a group, the group looks at us, we have a responsibility to, to actually produce the life of the Lord Jesus in us to make a difference out here, and the truth of the matter is, is one of the failures among pastors is to conclude that we have to sin every day, which simply gives us an excuse for failure any time we want to fail. It ain't so. It's never been so. It will not be so until Jesus comes back again, and it's still going to continue then. The only problem is we'll be in a resurrection body. Mm -hmm. Now, so notice this last statement here again, uh, Steve. Just a little bit of time. Um, uh, so then moving on from it, failed, by God, failed God by failing to carry out the responsibilities of a client nation. And those five responsibilities were mentioned above. Let's see them one more time. See, we're going to name these things several times. Go ahead. Evangelize the unbelievers in the USA. Okay, so that our responsibility. See, we have a responsibility to what group of people? Unsaved. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. See, in the believer. USA. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, we're not talking here about someplace else no. in the world. No, we're talking about right now. Right. It's a matter of first. As an evangelized world, you don't evangelize it first it's yourself. And I'll tell you what, it's so simple, Steve. Mm -hmm. I I had to call. Um, I had to call somebody today that was uh, a part of a, a business that's out there that I had a problem uh, with, and I had to get it mm -hmm. fixed. Good read. I mean, I, the turn on, turn uh, made the phone call, and I started to talk to somebody. And I said, "Excuse me, excuse me, where are you from?" They said, "In the Philippines." Mm -hmm. I said, "Listen, you you can't believe for those of you outside the country, you can't believe how many times I am able to talk to people outside the Philippines who are a representative of WebEx or PowWeb or somebody else. It's amazing. And I always get to tell them the story about missions in Philippines. Yeah. And by the time, I'm door, done, yeah. the time I'm done, listen, we had a great conversation and talked about Jesus over the phone to somebody in business mm -hmm. like that. Evangelize unbelievers in the USA. And then also, we're going to get down. Yeah, we're going to oh, yeah. so, so the next point number two again. To communicate Bible doctrine to those believers in the USA. In the United States of America. That's right. Number three, protect Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth. What kind of truth? Absolute, absolute right truth. Word. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean you split no, a hair. No, that doesn't mean maybe you, it's this way, maybe it's that, that way. That, no, that, no, 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 dogmatic. We need to know exactly what God is saying. Okay. For example, if God says I want you to do this, and you don't know the technique, or the technique that you use is skewed oh. in some way. For example. I uh, say, boy, Steve, you need to get saved. You say, oh, yeah, how do, you get, how do I get saved? I say, well, go get believe in the baptized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. see, that's not the truth. Yeah, right. So it has to be, how, how do I confess my sins? Well, just uh, get on your knees and just beat your breast, you yeah, know, yeah. and cry You're out. sorry for yourself. That, see, that's yeah. right, Steve. It's absolute truth, brother. Point number four. Protect that Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth. Provide the USA as a safe place for the Jews. That's, that's, that's see, the Jews, scattered. Jews yeah. are scattered all over yeah. the world. 
Now they're they're yeah. persecuted all over the world, but they could be safe here in America. And they're going back. They're some men are going back, but that is a Zionist movement. Mm-hmm. That's a political movement. It's not the movement of God taking God, Jesus taking the Jews back to Israel uh, in at the Second Advent. Altogether, we different. well know what the Word of God says about the nation that blesses the Jews and bless those that yeah. bless thee and curse those that curse thee. Another very important reason for the United States to be a safe place. For the Jews. Absolutely, Steve. And, and I pray for our president that under his reign, it will increase our relationships with the Jewish nation. Oh, absolutely. And he has. And he absolutely. has. Absolutely. Now, number five. The number five is to send out missionaries to evangelize unbelievers in other nations. Okay, now all five of those, what, why are we talking about those five? What are they? Those five things. Those are the responsibilities of a client nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, here's what we have we've got seven facts about a client nation. Now, the question is when we do this, you need to ask yourself your, this question. I've already said that the United States of America is a client nation since 1776. These are seven facts about a client nation. Once you see these seven facts, each time we ask or point this stuff, you ask and need to ask yourself, where are we in relationship to that point? That's what I was getting at earlier. Yes, sir. Point number one. A client nation requires a pivot of born-again Christians who reach spiritual adulthood and maintain that level of spiritual living. Okay, now stop there. What's the word, key word there? Pivot. Pivot. Now, that, listen, that like client nation, mm-hmm. listen, that like client nation is simply a biblical, it's a term mm-hmm. that we have used to describe yeah. a concept found in the Bible. The concept is there, but it doesn't give it a name. So how, and so rather than, rather than take 30 minutes every time we want to talk about something, they say, well, just a minute, now let me talk, let me explain this. You go on and on and on. They say, okay, that's fine. So uh, next time you come to Bible class, say, I need to talk to you about something. He say, you say, we just explained that to me last time. So the next time you come to Bible class, say, I need to talk to you about something. And you say, wait a minute, excuse me. Uh, I get the picture. Why are you wasting my time talking about the same thing and taking up an, ha- an hour and a half class to take 30 minutes to explain something you explained three times back there. Say, okay, let's do this. Let's call it a pivot. Let's call let's call it a client nation. Let's call it um, you know something else. Not and a word so, remnant use. That's right. So that mm-hmm. so that word that we're using is a term mm-hmm. is describing mm-hmm. a particular concept found in the Bible. Now let's ask ourselves what is the concept that that word pivot is describing. We'll go right here. Well, a pivot is defined as the accumulation of spiritually adult believers living in that client nation. So stop right here. You've got the United States of America, client mm-hmm. nation. Now what you're doing with God, you're looking down, he's looking down at this nation, yeah, he and he says, okay, now I'll tell you what. He said, I see X number of born-again Christians in that nation, in this nation. He sees them in Baptist churches. He sees them over here in this church. He sees them in the Methodist church. He sees them out here, assuming, though, that they are truly born-again Christians. They don't have to belong to one denomination. But God knows whether somebody is truly born again, whether you or I know it or not. And so God looks down and he says, okay, see, a pivot then is defined as an accumulation. Right. So you've got so many in, in Maumelle. You've got some in North Rock. You've got some in Los Angeles. You've got some in New York City. You've got some, some down there in Florida. you got some. So what God's doing is in, in the United States, he's looking down and he sees X oh. number of people. He sees Y number of, of Christians and that Y number is smaller than the X. And then he looks down here and he says, mm-hmm, but uh, Z right there, that's the number of born-again Christians who are doing this, who are actually, they are spiritually adult believers. Now, what does it take to be a spiritual adult believer? For us who have studied the Word of God in this area, we have some other terms, some terminology. Spiritual autonomy, a spiritual autonomy, actually um, spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, and spiritual maturity. There are three levels of spiritual adulthood. And God's looking down at the country and he's saying, mm-hmm, yes, X, that's the number That's the number in a country. Y, that's the number of believers. Z is the number, Z is the number of uh, born-again Christians in spiritual adulthood who actually make up the pivot. This is not the number of people in the in the country. It's not the number of Christians in the country. It's the number of believers who are advancing to spiritual maturity, which is a goal that is in fact reachable if you know how to get there. So that's what a pivot is. The pivot is Z group, okay? 
Now, how about point two? If the pivot begins to shrink in a client nation, the dis decreasing size of the pivot increases the size of disaster. So These attention getters within the client nation. So what happens is you start out with Z. That's the number. Of, that's the number of people in the pivot. And then God looks down and says, "Oop! Wait a minute, just a second. The size of the pivot is shrinking, and as the size of the pivot shrinks, the size of the disaster increases." And those are simply attention getters in the, United, in the United States and a client nation. So when you see all this pressure, that's going to help us to understand something. What is this num point number three? <clears throat> when signs of disaster begin in a client nation, you know that the size of the pivot is shrinking. The very fact that these disasters are happening is evidence of the fact that it is shrinking and they were going the wrong way. Well, yeah, absolutely right, Steve. Now let's take that just a bit further. When you take a look six months ago, no, oh, yes. And now look here. You look six months ago. You you see that you see the disaster. You see the you see the pressure. Well, you say, well, oh boy, something must be wrong because God's bringing the pressure to us. Okay. Then the, three weeks later, you see another one that's twice that size. Then you see another one six months later that's half that size, again. And so what happens as you see as you see the 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 pivot shrinking, the size of the disaster increases. Increase. The pressure of the, uh, that uh, that attack is going to increase. So what you are able to do is you're able to realize, wait a minute, this is telling me something. This isn't getting any better. It's getting worse. And the reason it's getting worse is the people in the country, these people who are moving toward adulthood, are actually they're either bailing out. And this is why this is why when you and I find ourselves. When you as a Christian find yourself under increased pressure in your life, this isn't the time to cave in. This is the time to suck it up and use God's word to use the faith rest technique. Realize he knows exactly what's going on, and all he's doing is increasing your strength as a born-again Christian because your strength doesn't come from you. Your strength comes from him and his word. And that's why, Dr. Jim, when we talk about sh shrinking, and it's not that all these churches are full of all, all believers or all full of mature believers. But when you look at the surveys like Barna and all, and they see the people leaving the churches in the groves, mm -hmm. that we understand why it's shrinking. You well, know? Yeah, but hold, hold it, Steve. Yeah, hold it. Not all of them are anyhow, but the numbers are the people. Yeah, but wait a minute. Don't. Hold it. No, I understand. You make sure you understand what you just said. Mm -hmm. Just because people are leaving the church doesn't mean the pivot's shrinking. Right. Yeah, they're going to be looking for doctrine, yes. <laughs> it's when, yeah, but it's when the adult believer mm -hmm. under pressure mm -hmm. caves in. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. oh, so gotcha. the very fact, the very fact, the reason people are leaving the church is because they realize they're not, not being getting, fed. Exactly. So they're leaving. But that isn't shrinking the pivot. The, they weren't even a part of the pivot to begin with. Yeah, that's right. See, that's not it. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's only when the, it's when the people who are advancing... Mm -hmm. And and they find into the t pressures and temptations. See, at, yeah. in at the at spiritual self-esteem, what that means is you know now who you are in Christ, and you keep advancing. You you uh, you grow to spiritual autonomy. That's when you're now able to stand on your own two feet, and you reach spiritual maturity. That maximizes your life. That's when you're occupied with the person of Christ in everything you do. So when you reach spiritual adulthood, uh, spiritual adulthood and you're in spiritual self-esteem, you now know who you are in Christ. I'm not beating myself over the head because of all those stupid things I did before I got saved or even after I got saved. You are able to understand who you are in Christ. But guess what? Knowing who you are in Christ, simply now, that doesn't take care of the pressure that you're under the next time a bit of pressure comes along. So, oh, I guess God's left me. God's gone from here. So you throw in the towel and you're gone. Now the pivot is shrinking. And so when those people give up the, the advancement in spiritual maturity, that's that's what's shrinking the pivot. That's right? that's exactly. what's shrinking the pivot. Not just because right. people aren't leaving churches in general. Yeah. And the fact that people are going to church is is yeah. part of the pivot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now point number four. When God's judgment, some form of disaster, falls on a client nation. God protects the pivot because they are fulfilling the responsibility of obedience to God. That's carrying out those five responsibilities. So, see, the pivot is always doing those five things. That's the good news about that's it. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And what we need to understand, and that's why when, that's why when, so, for example, what's happened in your family? Mm -hmm. with, with all, you know, with the, the disaster that took place with your, the homes and stuff. 
you didn't do anything wrong. And you can't you can't take the blame for that. You you are suffering by association with a whole mess of people out here that God saw fit not to stem the tide of the water coming down the, coming down the Arkansas River. <laughs> there were just some people, and that's why when you see the tornadoes, that's why when you see the hurricane across the south, and somebody said, "Well, God just God's taking care of that stuff down there. There's so much wickedness going on in this area. Guess what God's doing down there?" He say, "Well, wait a minute." Everybody down there can't be wicked. And you say, no, you don't understand. People who happen to be in a geographic location are going to suffer by association with those people in that geographic location when God decides to do a number on them. But remember this. He will always be with you. And read that point one more time. Mm, this is so good. When God's judgment, and that's some sort of disaster, falls on a client nation, God will protect the pivot. Because they're fulfilling the responsibility of obedience to God by carrying out those five responsibilities. That's exactly right. No. Mm. See, and, and what are those five responsibilities? Tell us one more time. Evangelizing the unbelievers that are in America and USA. Communicating the Bible doctrine to those believers in the USA. Protecting so Bible doctrine by communicating it absolutely true yeah. right, by the Word of God. And providing USA as a safe place for the Jews in, in America. Mm-hmm. And sending out missionaries to, un- to evangelize unbelievers in other nations. Exactly right. Now, point five. When the lifestyle of born again Christians who live in a client nation has a positive impact on the citizens of that client nation, that entire nation can be delivered from national disaster under the principle of blessing by association. So, see, the entire nation can, can be, be blessed, blessed by association when the pivot, when the, pivot, the mm-hmm. positive, when the, the um, client has a positive impact. That's the that the pivot has a positive impact. Guess what? The citizens of this nation, even those who are not a part of the pivot, they will be blessed by association. And that's exact. So listen to me, please, 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 please. Don't you turn me off. Listen to me. This is why today I don't give a rat's nest what you think about Donald Trump. It's the policies he's putting in in place. If you didn't hear him today on on uh, Fox News, yet yeah, don't turn me off. If you didn't hear him today on Fox News when he was talking to evangelicals, there was some clown on Facebook this morning that made some sort of a comment about Trump and he used a foul word. Then, then you got a soccer lady out here who used another foul term regarding Donald Trump. These people aren't getting it. It's not Donald Trump. It's not the man, it's the policies that he is putting in place that is making America great again. It's what he's doing, not who he is as a man. Get your eyes off of him and get your eyes on what he's doing. Because God, folks, listen, God has given us, Israel 9, he's given us that much time, and if you don't get it, and I don't get it, kiss it goodbye. And your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren are going to suffer because you and I didn't do the right thing. Mm. Now, with that in mind. How about point five, Steve? Well, we did that already. Yeah, do it again. When the lifestyle of born-again Christians who live in the client nation has a positive impact on the citizens of that client nation, that entire nation can be delivered from national disaster under the principle of blessing by association. Those people will be blessed by association with the born-again Christians who are living Christ-like, positive lives. Slow down. That's right. So they're blessed. It's the opposite of Cursing by association, yes, so the nation has gone immoral. Or, okay, or now point six, Steve. Well, during the national disaster, that pivot. No, no, come on, read that. No, 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 don't. <laughs> I want to make hear every word that's there. During a national disaster, the pivot in the client nation remains physically safe, yeah. but those who are rejecting God's plan for the client nation, they're destroyed by means of those disasters. See, that, that's exactly right. See, the the pivot. I, I'm, I want to be a part of that pivot. I, I am in that pivot right now. I don't have any doubt about it. Yeah, I know what, I know what I'm doing. I know what the Christian way of life is. And I'm attempting to do this. Uh, attempting, I'm doing it. Yeah. Now, here's the issue. During a national disaster, see, that's, so when you look at California, mm-hmm. when, you look at, when you look at the tornadoes across here, when you, look at the, when you look at the flooding during a national disaster, just so happens it's in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. It was in California. Oh, no, it was down in Louisiana. No, it was in Texas. No, it's up in North Dakota. See, so here's the issue. During a national disaster, the pivot in a client nation, that's pivot all across the, across the country. A, the pivot in a client nation remains physically safe. So you may be in smack dab in the middle of that. 
and you will be safe. Now, someone said, oh, wait a minute, just a second. My dad was a, was a mature believer. Let's assume it was right. He was a mature believer, and he died in this. See, that's why you have to understand doctrine. If somebody died on their way to, on the way to spiritual doctrine, if they died on the way to spiritual maturity, and you knew they were advancing, how do you answer the fact that this person was positive, but they died early? Here's the issue. When that takes place, God understood exactly who they were, where they were, what their life was like, but he had to use that individual and the death of that person for a particular reason, and he did it, and he took their, took their life. Now, here's the issue. God knows what they would have become or what they could have achieved if they'd have remained alive, and guess what? God will deal with that when they get to the BMC. Okay. Now, what's the conclusion to all this, Steve? National disasters in a client nation are designed by God the Father to separate winners from losers. That's right. Now, see, the, that's what happened. That's right. So, in, in the national disaster in the client nation, forget about something else. In a client nation, when you have a national disaster, God is it, designed by God the Father to separate winners and losers. Now, here's the issue. You have to understand our term, winners and losers, because it's not what many people think it yeah. is. You're not a winner because you're a Christian. Right. You can be a Christian and be a loser, mm -hmm. not lose your salvation, right. but you lose the blessing in time and the reward in eternity because you fail, fail to be obedient. So what is a winner, Steve? Winners are Christians who are obedient to their client nation responsibilities. That's right. Those five things we mentioned. That's right. right. So what's a loser? Well, losers are Christians who are disobedient to their client nation responsibilities. And see, disobedience, disobedience here isn't necessarily willful. You can be disobedient and be ignorant mm -hmm. because you didn't know, because your pastor wasn't teaching you the Word of God. You had no clue as to what you should have been doing, but you failed because there you are. So winners, what's a winner? Uh, are Christians that, who are obedient to their client nation responsibility. Okay, and what's a loser? L losers are Christians that are disobedient to their client nation responsibility. And what are those responsibilities? Of course, number one, to evangelize the unbelievers in the USA, to communicate Bible doctrine to those believers in the USA, to protect the Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth, right. and to provide the USA as a safe place for the Jews, and send out missionaries to evangelize unbelievers in other nations. Absolutely. That's our responsibility. Now, let's tie all this together. Mm -hmm. Let me go down this list. First of all, you are an American citizen. Now, everybody online with me tonight is an American citizen, except our friend Roger Lamuco, yeah. and he's a, he's a uh, citizen of the Philippines. But he, he, it will help him to understand what's going on in our country if he understands the scripture here, and he does. This man is another man who is actually positive toward the teaching of the Word of God. Now, first of all, we are American citizens. Mm -hmm. As American citizens right now, we live in a client nation. Mm -hmm. Number three, God has assigned five, uh, has assigned five responsibilities to a born-again Christian who resides in a client nation. So if you are a born-again Christian, these are assigned to you. Evangelize the unbeliever. Communicate Bible doctrine to the believers. Protect Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth. Provide the USA as a place safe for the, for the Jews. Send out missionaries to evangelize believers in other nations. Point four, to fulfill these responsibilities, God requires a pivot of born-again Christians in a client nation. See, if you don't have a pivot, you can't fulfill, you can't fulfill the responsibilities because there's no obedience. Now, the next, po the next point five then, Steve, a pivot is the group of believers living in a client nation who have reached spiritual adulthood. <clears throat> and there are three levels of spiritual adulthood. Spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, and spiritual maturity. Now, if you're online with me on Facebook or on YouTube or out here on, on WebEx, uh, by the way, uh, in, in, the, in the creation of my, um, the revitalization of our website, the Christian Way of Life Church, I'm going to place a spot out there and on my uh, on my constitutionaloriginalism.blog site, I'm going to place a, a place out there for people to ask me questions. And I, you leave the question, I will answer the question, okay? Now, here's the issue point number 60. In every generation of American history, there has been a certain number of born-again Christians living in the United States. 
who have fulfilled the responsibilities of this client nation. So what happens is since 1776, mm -hmm. we are a client nation because God saw X number of people down here who are tuned in doing these mm -hmm. five things that are required by a client nation. Now, what happens is in every generation right down to today, there have been a certain number of born-again Christians living in the United States who have fulfilled the responsibility. So what that means, these people, are they are part of the pivot. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't tell you what size it is. Mm -hmm. Now, what we aren't, go ahead. Or we wouldn't exist by now if there weren't. So oh, absolutely. That's obviously, they may be shrinking, but it's still there, obviously. It hasn't mm -hmm. reached the point where God gets rid of that client nation mm -hmm. and goes on to somebody else. Now, watch this, Dave. The next point, these are the five things we do. Oh. Now, let's talk about the shrinking pivot, okay? Mm -hmm. So you start out here with a pivot this size, mm -hmm. and that, that's the, that, the pivot in, the, uh, in a client nation. Now, watch, hold on a second here out, out here, folks. Listen, the size of the pivot. What you're going to see is these circles are going to be diminishing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't tell you how many people make that up. Right. It's just that when you first start out as a client nation, you have a pivot big enough for God to assign that responsibility to that nation. Now, what happens over a period of time, it doesn't have to be this way, but over a period of time, over 234 years, here's what happens. We are shrinking, we are shrinking, we are shrinking, we are shrinking. And we don't know where we are yet. We don't know how much smaller it will get before God finally says, no, oh, that's it, folks, throw in the towel. But what does happen when God sees the pivot shrinking, this means we are failing as a nation to carry out our responsibility to do those five things that constitute the character of a client nation. So when you reach a certain point, that's when the disaster comes. The people will either be scattered and or the nation will be destroyed. Okay? Dr. Hibber, can I say one thing? It reminds sure. me of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah when, he, when there's so many people populating those, those cities and he bargained for 25 and and the ratio got so low, he destroyed them. That's right. And That's so, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So now we're talking about the shrinking pivot, point number one. When you understand that this book, the Bible, and it's this document, the Constitution, are organically connected, you cannot ignore the following facts. So we're going to see some mm -hmm. facts here. But what you need to realize is that the Bible and the Constitution mm -hmm. are organically connected. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to know what an organic connection means, you take a glass of water, and you take, uh, say, a wash towel, and you set the wash towel down the side here and put the glass of water over here. You see two different things, okay? Mm -hmm. But now what happens? If you take that towel, that washcloth, and drop it in the glass, guess what happens? The water is absorbed. You don't have any more water mm -hmm. in the glass. The, uh, the washcloth absorbs it, and the dry cloth is now saturated. They have become one with each other. They are organically connected. So when you see an organically connected Bible and Constitution of the United States, when, it, when you're interpreting the Constitution as it was intended to be in, uh, interpreted, now what you have is an organically connected Bible and Constitution so that the Bible doesn't have any errors, the Constitution doesn't errors. The Bible matches the Constitution. The Constitution matches the Bible. There cannot be any difference. Now, that's what an organic connection means. Now, with that in mind, notice the you cannot ignore these, these facts when you know that the Bible and the Constitution are organically connected. Number one, the Bible provides you with the freedom to fulfill your client nation responsibilities. Okay, so you've got a responsibility as a client nation, and the Bible is going to give you the freedom, freedom to do that. What's the Constitution? Well, the Constitution was designed to protect your freedom for the following purposes. It does, Listen, the Constitution doesn't provide the government to do anything for you. The government is designed to protect what God has given you. Okay, so they're going to protect some things. Now, guess, listen, guess what the Constitution is going to protect, Steve? Number one, protect freedom to evangelize the unbelievers in the USA. That's that right. Sounds familiar. That's right. Right. What else are you going to do? Protect freedom to communicate Bible doctrine to those believers in the USA. So we find protection again. Go ahead. Protect freedom to protect Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth. Okay. Protect freedom to provide the USA as a safe place of safety for the Jews. And... Protect freedom to send out missionaries to evangelize unbelievers in other nations. So tonight, when you t at eight o'clock tonight, 
in, in one minute, don't you dare leave me, you put it on record. Because in one minute, no, let's see, it's going to be 8 o'clock there. It'll be 9 o'clock here. Be, uh, no, it's, our, it's 8 o'clock our time. 8 o'clock our time right now, so, uh, it's going to be 9 o'clock in New York. I guess this is when the, this one, the Democratic debate takes place tonight. Oh, okay. The debate takes place tonight. Right. Now, watch what happens. When you listen to these folks, when you listen to these people, you're going to hear every minute is absolute 180 out from what I'm telling you. And if you vote for any of that kind of stuff, you are part of the problem and not part of the, not part of the solution. I don't care whether you like Donald Trump or not. If you vote for that in that direction, you are a part of the problem, period. And if you don't believe me, you wait until you get to the beam of seat and ask Jesus. No, he's going to ask you. Okay? <laughs> now, see, those five things are the government is responsible to protect us, not give us anything. Here are two issues. Mm. Go ahead, Steve. Number one, because you are a born-again Christian and because you are a citizen of the USA. Because you are two things, born again and a citizen of the United States, you must have the freedom to do these five things. Mm. That's why we take a look at what the Democrats, when the rhinos, when you look at the deep state, when you look at the socialists, when you look at the Muslims, None of them are doing what they need to do to protect our right in this in this nation that's a client nation. And when you finally get what we're saying here tonight, you're going to understand exactly why we got all this pressure in the United States. They're doing is actually contrary to this. That's right. Exactly. They're contributing. Exactly. They're contributing to the to the downfall of our country. See, mm -hmm. go ahead right here. And here they are again. Freedom to evangelize the unbelievers in the USA. Hello. Freedom to communicate Bible doctrine to those believers in the U.S. Hello? Freedom to protect that Bible doctrine by communicating absolute truth. Hello? Freedom to provide a, the USA as a safe place for the Jews. Mm -hmm. Freedom to send out missionaries to evangelize other unbelievers in other nations. See, so what happened? The Bible gives us freedom. It comes from God. Mm -hmm. as revealed in his word. Now, what happened is the state then is required to protect the freedom mm -hmm. so that we can do these things to resolve the mm -hmm. spiritual battle called the internal conflict. They did their job. We did our job. God will bless. And it has blessed us That's 243 exactly. years That's right. so far. So now, now look here. The Bible teaches that you, uh, no, I'm sorry. The Bible teaches you, it teaches me, mm -hmm. that God the Father has provided every human being, every human being, not just Christians, mm -hmm. every human being on the planet, with certain inalienable rights. And he has provided every American with a constitution in the United States, America now, every American with a constitution in the United States that was ratified for the purpose of creating a federal government that has the responsibility and the only responsibility is to protect the inalienable rights of we the believer. And what are those inalienable rights, Dale? Uh, the Steve? right to life, the right to liberty, the right to pursue happiness, and the right to own property. And by the way, your money that you work for is your property. Guess what? The government is stealing your money by taxation, period. Number four. Now, for you to believe what I'm telling you this evening, you <laughs> must have an accurate understanding of two things, the Bible and the U.S. Constitution. Now stop right here. Because, see, this is why, this is why I told people that on that blog site, I have created that blog site to help people understanding, understand the meaning of the Constitution. I'm teaching the Bible here, but I wanted a place where I could actually, uh, you know, every day of the week, if I wanted to put something out there, I could put it out there. People could go read it and, uh, and you know, and say, okay, I understand that. I agree with that. I've learned something. So now, for you to believe what I'm telling you and Steve is telling you this evening you have to have an accurate understanding of two things. You have to have an accurate understanding of the Bible. You have to have an accurate understanding of the, of the Constitution. First of all, the Bible. Mm -hmm. You must have an accurate understanding, first of all, of what the Bible says. And then you have to have an accurate understanding of what the Bible means. Mm -hmm. You know what it says. You think you know what it says, mm -hmm. but the question is, what does it mean? Secondly... The U.S. Constitution. You must have an accurate understanding of what the Constitution says, and I will guarantee you that the majority of Americans in this country today have never even read the Constitution. Oh, they've heard the word. They might be able to spell the word. But yes, the American Constitution, you have to know what it says, 
What does Article 1 say? What does Article 2 say? What does Article 3 say? What does Article 5 say? 6 and Article 7. It would take you two hours to read the Constitution. You might have to look up some words along the way because it's written in the English language in 243 years ago. But now here's the issue. What does the Constitution say? Yeah, but are you listening to the people in Washington, D.C. tell you what it means? Are you listening to the attorneys? Are you looking, listening to the Supreme Court? Are you listening to federal judges? Who are you listening to? Why don't you listen to Patrick Henry? Why don't you listen to Alexander Hamilton? Why don't you listen to Benjamin Franklin and the founding fathers in the, in the Federalist Papers, in the Anti-Federalist Papers? They tell you what it means. Then you... Then you look in um, Black's Law Dictionary. You look in uh, uh, Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Listen, it doesn't take a genius to understand what these things are all about. So the Bible, what it says, what it means. Constitution, what it says, what it means. I would I'd encourage you, learn what these two things are saying. How about number five, Steve? Without an accurate understanding of the organically connected Bible and Constitution, you will contribute to the destruction. Yes. You have a skewed uh, a skewed understanding of it. We'll keep on going. Of this nation of the USA, whether with or without an understanding that you are doing so. Yeah. You don't even know you're doing it. You're just... That's, see, if you don't have an accurate understanding of the Bible you're part and of the Constitution, you, that's right. You don't know uh, what a client nation ought to be doing. And all of a sudden, you look up, and we've got all this pressure out here, and now you're going to blame Washington, you're going to blame him, you're going to blame her, you're going to blame your wife, your husband, your children, somebody else. No, no, no. It's you. It's you, because you, we the people, okay? But here, this, this is the way it was intended, Steve, on the left-hand side here. I don't have the rest of the world here now. I've got the United States. That's what we're talking about, 1776 to 2019. We are a client nation unto God. Now, what happens is the, the, the Constitution and the Bible, basically the Bible and the Constitution. The Constitution is based on the Bible. Now, they're organically connected. So there's the United States. That's the way it's intended to be. We the people, we are sovereign in the United States. Not Congress, not the President, not the Supreme Court. We the people are sovereign. We created the states. We the people did in 13 colonies. We the people created the states, and the states they created the Constitution. Constitution. So we the people are sovereign over the states and over the federal government. The state is federal uh, is uh, uh, sovereign over the federal government. The, the federal government is low on the totem pole. But because we have failed to understand the Bible and the Constitution, guess what? Washington, D.C. has turned it all oh, upside wow. down. Now, you are no more than just do what we say. Do what we say. Now, there's an addendum here, Steve. And uh, addendum one are problems contributing to the failure of a nation. Let me share this, okay? Okay. There are three major problems in the United States of America today. I don't care whether you agree with me or not. I know what I'm talking about. Three major problems. Pastors have failed and continue to fail America, America's congregants. The people in the pew are being failed because pastors. Now, that is a generalization. Right. I know your pastor is the, is the best person in the world. Oh, there's nobody. I understand that. But as a generalization, pastors have failed and continue to fail America's congregants. Why? They failed to teach the Word of God. The unadulterated, uh, it's, it's political correctness. It's emotionalism. It's good time, okay? So pastors have failed. Public education has failed and continues to fail its students mm -hmm. even today. Your government has systematically and continuously failed to protect your inalienable rights. So, Steve, there are three major mm -hmm. problems. What's, what's number one? The pastors have failed, the public education has failed, and the government has failed systematically and continuously That's failed it. to protect our rights. So we've got three Native failures. Rights. Pastors, public education, and, and U.S. We're, government. We're fighting a battle on three fronts here. That's exactly <laughs> right. Now, Pat, let's talk about each one of these separately. Pastors have failed, failed you. Pastors have failed you. Generalization now. See, the responsibility of a pastor teacher is to teach you the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God's word. And he needs to do it with a biblical worldview so that you can be salt and light out there in the public square. The public square is when you walk outside your door. When you walk outside, there they are. There's the worlds out there waiting for you. Now, it's my responsibility. It's the responsibility of every pastor, whether you're a Baptist, 
whether you're an Episcopalian, whether you're a Lutheran, whether you're a Catholic, whether you're a Methodist, whether you're an Assembly of God, whether you're Pentecostal, it is the responsibility of the pastor teacher to teach you the whole counsel of God. Now watch this. The whole counsel of God. That means you better understand something about tithing. You better understand something about abortion. You better understand when life began. You need to understand what, uh, what constitutes salvation. You need to know what the rapture is. Is there going to be a second coming? Do you? Excuse me. Mm, it's uh, the responsibility of the pastor to give you the whole counsel of God's word. There, God's word will touch every circumstance of life. Ignorance keeps us away from that. Now, what happens when you understand the whole counsel of God's word and it, with a biblical worldview? What's going on over there? What's going on? Well, no, we don't have to deal with that because that's over there. No, no. You have to understand the Bible and be able to answer every question about what's going on anywhere in the world. That's a biblical worldview. Why? So that you, individually, you, 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 male, female, you, can be salt and light. That means you are going to preserve. Salt is a preservative, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay? And this is, this is your responsibility out there in the public square. In other words, get out of the house sometime. Deal with the people. You can do it. You can do that on the phone. You can talk to somebody out there on the phone. See, now, secondly, pastors are failing in their responsibility. Number one, they're not doing that. Evangelism is important to every American for the purpose of beginning his or her Christian life. See, that's why we do evangelize. You can't start your Christian way of life until you get saved. Right. Okay. Third, fourthly, however, being a born again Christian is not the end of the journey. No. You get saved it's today, oh boy, there you go, you're going to heaven. And you sit back and wait wait for the ride, take the ride. And here you are out there living like a, you know, whatever you're doing, and you're not being obedient to the word of God, you're destroying a part of the destruction of the client nation. So until you as a born-again Christian learn that God has a plan for your life, why oh you are, you and you and you and you. Until you learn that as a born again Christian, that God has a plan for your life, not your husband, not your son, not your wife, not your mother, you. He has a plan for your life. And then you begin to live out that plan, you are living on the wrong side of history that eventually results in God the Father allowing America as a client nation to be destroyed. Period. Therefore, you as a born again Christian must have a pastor teacher who is teaching you how to grow spiritually and how to function as a spiritually adult believer, whose purpose is to perpetuate the client nation for the benefit of your children, grandchildren, and all future generations. Go back and look at those five things and ask yourself, are you contributing in a valuable way by being obedient to the word of God so that this client nation can continue to deal with your children, your grandchildren, and all future generations? Now, Steve, Public education has failed. Problem number two. Number one there, pal. For the last 85 years, the goal of public education has not been to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic or to think rationally. Stop right there. I'm telling you, for the last 85 years, the goal of public education has not been to teach reading, writing, or do arithmetic or think rationally. As a matter of fact, secondly, the goal of our public education, what is the goal? The goal of public schools has been has been to teach children to get along together peacefully, blacks with whites, with Latinos, etc. Just get along. And all you have to see is the disruption of classroom. Children taking over. Excuse me. They can't read. They can't write. They can't do arithmetic. They can't think rationally. Today's philosophy of education, here it is. Today's philosophy of education is based on a lie. The lie is that human beings are animals without a mind or soul. The lie is, to, is that you can't be taught you uh, you can be taught like an animal. The lie is that there is no God or no Creator. Now, as we move down toward, our, I'll finish this here. This philosophy I've just told philosophy of education. This philosophy has created devastating effects on America's student population. Millions of high school dropouts and graduates are functionally illiterate, unable to un, and unable to think in the abstract. What does it mean to be illiterate? That doesn't mean they can't read, Steve. That means they don't understand what they read, and they're unable to think in the abstract. A plus B plus C equals what? They can't think that way. So here's a principle of life. If you can't read and you, can't, and you have been lied to 
You cannot read and you've been lied to about the early history of our great nation. You will never understand the Constitution that was designed to protect your freedom in this client nation with the following results. The federal government tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Does that sound like freedom? No. The federal government tells you that God did not give you inalienable rights. The federal government tells you what the government gives you is privileges just as easily to take away from you as they were to be given to you. When the federal government takes away, uh, takes control of every aspect of your life, you are now a slave to a government that hates God, hates the Bible, hates the church, hates Christianity, hates Christians, and makes laws to remove your freedom of speech, remove your right to worship as you desire, remove freedom of the press, remove your right to peaceably assemble, remove your right to complain to your government about its removal of the freedoms given to you by God. If you don't understand that, why don't you go back and read the Ten Amendments to the Constitution? Your government has failed you. This is the third thing. And the last thing, Steve, your government has failed you. Pastors have failed. The public education has failed. Now your government has failed you. Your Constitution is being interpreted by people who motivate. What's that? Misinterpreted. Misinterpreted. That's right. Your Constitution is being misinterpreted by people whose motivation is to control your life as part of the old man, old woman thing. The people who are misinterpreting your Constitution are little Supreme Court justices, federal judges, lawyers who did not study the, uh, did not study the Constitution in law school, liberal politicians effected, elected by to public office, liberal college professors who favor government control, and liberal public school teachers who perpetuate the lie. Only after you as a born-again Christian fully understand the Bible and the Constitution will you be armed to stop the divine destruction of a client nation. Read on, Steve. Are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem? That's right. Here's very quickly, addendum number two. The United States what? Is not a democracy. The United States is a constitutional republic. The United States is ruled by laws. The United States is not ruled by man. Unconstitutional laws are invalid from the moment they are passed. You better listen to that. Unconstitutional laws are invalid from the moment they are passed. Go ahead. We, the people, are under no obligation to be obedient to unconstitutional laws. No obligation to be obedient. That means you are disobeying the law that is not constitutional. Go ahead. But we, the people, are required to be, to be obedient to legitimate laws. And this is from the J.B. Phillips translation. Go ahead. Romans 13.1. Every Christian ought to obey the civil authorities, for all legitimate authority is derived from God's authority. See, we don't, we're not required to be obedient to, to authority unconstitutional. Yeah. It's only legi- legitimate authority, which is constitutional authority. Now, there are three, there are three contemporary methods used to interpret the Constitution. Originalism, as our founding fathers intended. Mm-hmm. Textualism, which means to interpret the Constitution and, and read the words, you just change the meaning of the words. That's textualism. Living Constitution, that simply means the original Constitution is outdated. We're just going to do something else. Now listen to this. In 2004, Public Law 108-447, Section 111B, says each educational constitu- each educational institution that receives federal funds for a fiscal year shall hold a co- an educational program on the United States Constitution on December 17th of such year for the students served by the educational institution. They are required to, not doing to have a day. And I, I called some, stu- some schools to find out, and they say, yeah, they're doing it. I don't know that they're all doing it. Mm-hmm. Now, only a virtuous people, listen, Benjamin Franklin, listen to this, only a virtuous people, there's the obedience of the word of God, okay? Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. Mm-hmm. Say hello to the federal government. And John Adams says, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Our Constitution. Mm-hmm. Question, if it's made for moral and religious people, where do you find out how to be moral and religious? Where do you find out? In the Word of God. In the Word of God. It, it, our Constitution, is wholly inadequate to the government of any other kind of people. So if you're not moral and religious, forget it. Our Constitution worth nothing. Okay? Now, that concludes our study for tonight, and I would pray that maybe uh, you, if you want these notes, go back there and mm-hmm. get them. This is some prayer, Steve. 
Father, we thank you that for at least for now, America has been spared, and we do see the signs on and the writing on the wall of the tendency to yes. go in these ways we've studied as as so with Israel. Yes. So, Father, we ask your 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 divine grace for this little bit of time you've given us. We mm. pray for our president and his cabinet and all yes. those advise him and work with him and give him uh, victory in spite of the opposition. And Father, please suppress the evil intentions of those who who have uh, intentions to suppress the these things that were taking away our freedom. So yes. we just pray for our nation every day. If we have yes. to make it a habit to pray for Donald Trump and his family and his, and his organization, the military, and for Jerusalem and yes. uh, the Jewish people and Israel and the times we face. In mm. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. I'm just not going to call your names, but I'm just going to go ahead and close uh, out our recording here and uh, shut down uh, and be back uh, on Sunday morning. God bless all of you.